Thank you so much. Uh, sorry about the delay, we had hardware issues. Like uh, I was told, my name is Patrick Kettner and I work out in Seattle on Microsoft on Edge. Um, I get to play with all new standard stuff in the browser, so I get to play with PWAs for like three years now, Houdini, a whole bunch of other new really fun stuff. Uh, but today I'm here to talk to you about JavaScript, or more specifically, the lack of JavaScript. Now, this isn't a knock on JavaScript whatsoever. I'm a huge fan of the web in general, JavaScript especially. I started using the internet when it looked like this, uh, which was really, really cool. At a really young age, we had computers uh, where I grew up. And so I've been on the web for almost two decades now, which is crazy to think about. And uh, what was really cool about being there so early is I've been able to see the web evolve over time. I saw it go from you know, really horrible, crappy pages like this and evolve to more dynamic experiences with DHTML. Anybody DHTML? No, come on, man. Yes, thank you, finally. Uh, DHTML was awesome. It was sort of like this interactive concept for the web back when that was a horrible idea for performance and computers couldn't even see videos. Uh, but it was a step forward on the web. It was one of the big evolutions. Um, you know, from there, though, we had kind of the browser wars where you step, kept on adding features to IE or to Netscape, and it was really, really hard to have a website that actually worked on the web. It would kind of only work in one single browser. And so we saw the web continue to evolve to continue with things like standards and the Wired News redesign. Uh, if, for those who don't remember, Wired.com was one of the first websites to actually implement a standards-based layout design. You know, it wasn't using, like, tables or all these other gross hacks in order to actually function. And it was a huge step forward on the web. It proved that you could write a standards-based website for something that wasn't just a toy. Um, and, you know, the web continued to get better and better. We had stuff like responsive design, where we understood that you didn't have to make a website with static width or, you know, 960 pixels. It could be... It could work on a phone and not be an identical experience. It wasn't just scaled down. You could have you know, responsive experiences. And much in the same way, I think in a few years, when we look back to where we are today, we'll think of the next step of this evolution as progressive web apps. Now, I'm sure everyone here knows what progressive web apps are, but this kind of idea that we can have these compelling offline app-like experiences, no matter what your device, was revolutionary just a couple of years ago, and now is almost starting to become expected when it comes to creating apps from scratch. And as somebody that's been involved with progressive web apps for nearly three years now uh, at, at Microsoft, I kind of come to expect that experience on all websites and get frustrated when I don't have it. And that's kind of what happened recently. I, was, um, I travel a lot. I go to different conferences or go to different companies to talk. And frequently, I'll be working on demos on the plane. And then you know, the plane takes off, and all of a sudden, my internet's killed, and my projects have to stop if I'm using you know, web-based editors. This is CodePen. I'm sure a lot of people here use it. And it was fantastic. You know, it was this web-based scratch pad where you could create quick demos for different ideas. And what was one of the most revolutionary things for CodePen compared with earlier stuff like JS Fiddle was this thing up at the top. Uh, you can't really read it on the screen, but the idea is that you don't just have to write vanilla CSS. You can use preprocessors. In this case, I'm using SCSS. Uh, so rather than writing vanilla CSS, I'm able to write you know, CSS and SAS the way that I would in most production websites. You know, I want to have these much more uh, terse and much more complex layout designs inside of CSS. However, you know, SAS, as wonderful as it is, is written in Ruby. It's not actually native to the web. It's something from a completely different world, and that's unfortunately something that just doesn't work on the web. So if I wanted to write my SAS code, I have to be connected to the internet. And that's because every single time you write SAS code in CodePen or similar editors, what they do is that once they sense that you stop typing, they grab all of the text, they send it up to the server, the server processes all of that stuff in Ruby, and it sends bound the CSS result and injects it into the page. So if you're not online, you can't connect to the server, it, it breaks, and that really sucks. But I'm stubborn, and I want things to work on the web. And so I decided I would start to try and play with it to make SAS work on the web. In order to do that, I founded this project called Opal. Opal was an existing thing. Uh, it's not a language. It's a transpiling project. The idea is Opal allows you to take Ruby code and then convert it into JavaScript in a way that it theoretically results in the exact same kind of an output. What that ends up looking like is that you have Ruby code, you go ahead and you run some kind of Opal command on top of it, and then it spits out JavaScript code. Usually pretty ugly JavaScript code, but it's JavaScript code that theoretically does the exact same thing. And the way that that works is through JavaScript transpilation. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with transpilation, it's a concept of converting one language to another, and it breaks down into three main parts, lexing, parsing, and code generation. 
Just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm going to give a high-level overview of what those different steps mean. And we'll start, of course, with Lexing. Lexing is also known as tokenization. And what that means is that we actually go through our code character by character in a file, one letter at a time, and start to look for things called tokens that we recognize. In this case, it'll be stuff like the var statement to mean a variable, sum to mean a name of a variable, the equal sign has meaning. All these different things are individual concepts, like I said, called tokens. Now, this actually happens to be a syntactically valid JavaScript code, and it completely tokenizes, as we can see. However, at the lexing step, the order doesn't matter. This still lexes fine. The lexing thing doesn't give a shit about what your code actually means. It just wants to make sure that the language you're using, the letters you're using, are correct. Where we go to apply actual syntactical meaning to our code is in the next step, the parsing step. Parsing takes those individual tokens and starts to apply actual meaning so it understands you know, what you're talking about in your code. So in this case, we're setting a variable called sum. It is set equal to the integer of one plus the integer of two. Very simple code. Um, but now we, the, it basically, if you've ever had like a parser error, it's because it doesn't understand the type of code that you're running. You, you had some kind of a typo along the way that ends up making it, you know, that translation doesn't end up working when it comes to the engine. And finally, once we have parsed the code, we've created this kind of tree-like structure of what you are trying to do. Uh, so in this case, you know, we have this new program that's a variable declaration. And this sort of a structure is also called an abstract syntax tree. Uh, it's something you might, or an AST. You're probably familiar with this if you do stuff with Webpack or OCaml or any of these other languages that end up getting converted into JavaScript in the end. An AST represents the entire concept of your program. We take that AST, and it actually outputs the actual code. Once we have our AST, we can convert from one language to another. So in this case, our incredibly complex JavaScript program can be converted to Ruby just by stripping off that var, and hooray, we've done it. So now that we have a rough understanding of what transpilation is, we can dig into actually converting uh, SAS into JavaScript. So, we create a Ruby, a Ruby file, in this case, uh, opal sas.ruby. Uh, we require an opal. This is how they include uh, modules inside of Ruby, if you're unfamiliar. In this case, we're in, in, in including the entire opal runtime. We also have to include the opal parser. The opal parser is a subset of opal. It's specifically the thing that's used to parse your Ruby string. Now, we're not actually writing Ruby. We're writing a SAS code in the browser. But because SAS can include Ruby, and it basically is considered the entirety of the Ruby language, we have to include the parser at runtime. Uh, finally, we have the SAS library, the full, uh, the full Ruby SAS library you would use on the server. And then we have our only function in this file, in this case, SAS builder, which takes in a string and options object, and then we take that string, pass it over to sas.engine. It you know, churns on that thing, and then eventually outputs the, uh, the generated CSS code through that dot .render call. So uh, at that point, I thought I'd figured out everything. I run the command line. I get uh, new opal sas.js. I felt cocky because there were no errors in the command line. I create a HTML file, open it up, and it immediately errors. And that brings me to my first rule of JavaScript transpilation, and that is that it never works the first time. Eventually, you can get stuff to work, but because if you imagine that you know, Ruby is nearly a 30-year-old language, Opal's five years old, SAS is 10 years old, there's a lot of assumptions and a lot of mistakes that have been made over those decades between programming languages. So you're almost definitely going to have to kind of shave some rough corners in between languages in order to make it work. And so in this case, that's what I did. So I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I had never programmed Ruby before I started doing this, really. I had no idea how Ruby works or anything about it. I'm a web person. I really only know JavaScript really well. But I didn't let that discourage me. I am pretty stubborn. And so if you can't read this error here, it says unmatched method, matched size for the class SAS util multibyte string scanner. I have no idea what any of that means. And so I just grab a string. And then I grep over the entire code base of SAS in order to find out you know, where is that used. Turns out it's really only used in one location. So I open up my code editor, and I start to search. And I find it. OK, so they're defining this thing called class multibyte string scanner. And it says it is a wrapper of the native string scanner class. Uh, what that means doesn't really matter. But I did pick up on the fact that it says the native string scanner class. So I do some digging, and it turns up that the string scanner class, which is a thing built into the Ruby language has this method called match size, which is just an API that exists that the SAS library was using. It was trying to call match size, and it turns out that Opal hadn't polyfilled that thing. It hadn't transpiled that code. It didn't know what to do with it. And so it brings me to rule two, and that is that tools aren't perfect. 
Again, Opal is an amazing project that has all kinds of uh, abilities to bring Ruby code into JavaScript, but it hasn't done literally every single thing you can possibly do in Ruby. So in this case, I had to actually patch the tool in order to get it to work. So not knowing how Ruby or Opal works, I dig into Opal. I start pulling up String Scanner just to make sure. So in the Opal project, OK, they, are, they did implement String Scanner, which is good. I don't have to implement everything. And then I open that up. And I start looking at how this file is structured. Uh, the Opal project is actually a Ruby project, despite the fact that it's outputting JavaScript. And uh, what it ended up being, I eventually discovered, was a whole bunch of different functions, uh, which are things like beginning of line or scan or all these different things are Ruby functions. But it turns out that those map to the Ruby API names. And what they're doing is they're returning a string of JavaScript. And so what's happening is that they're basically saying, every single time that we call beginning of line, replace that with this string of JavaScript where we inject these special variables. So in order to support, um, in order to support this new API, we have to implement it in JavaScript. So I go back to the documentation. I pull up what the uh, definition of match size is, which is effectively get the most recent match from like a regex, and then get the length of that string. It's a really straightforward concept. Uh, and I create this diff real quick, send it upstream, uh, patch it locally, and run it. And now it works, and there's no errors. And I felt great. It's really, really cocky at this point, because I was like, I've conquered the universe. I've made it work. And so I end up calling the Opal code in order to make it you know, transpile basically nothing. Uh, it's hard to read here, but it's literally just an empty CSS rule. And it immediately errs again. At this point, days have been wasted, and I have nothing to show for it. My boss is getting really questioning what I'm doing. And that brings me to rule two. This entire project is super, super tedious. It's the exact same small problems over and over and over again every single time, no matter what. There's no way to transpile something that isn't in a tedious manner. Uh, but there are ways to save time if you simplify as much as possible. Now, it would take me forever to go over every single problem I you know, went over when I was doing this project. But suffice to say that this particular issue, uh, where the API of 2SIM is not uh, existing in Opal, is because that concept can't really be transpiled from Ruby to JavaScript, because there's certain edge cases where it doesn't really make sense. Uh, however, the way that SAS was using it didn't need those edge cases. So I can rewrite it the Ruby code in different ways in order to make it work, which is fine. It, ends up passing the exact same tests, everything works. So eventually, I need to patch the SAS library, the Opal library, and not to get ahead of myself, but also dozens, if not hundreds, of gem files or dependencies inside of those projects in order to make stuff work. And that can be kind of terrifying when it gets to actually running it in a production environment. You know, at first, I was just literally editing those files in place. But God forbid I actually accidentally do like a gem update or a git pull, and all those changes go away, and I lose weeks of work. That would suck. And so I end up trying to automate as much as I can. I ended up using a thing called Opal Webpack, which is just a way to take an Opal project and bring it into the Webpack world. Um, and then I used String Replace Loader. Uh, String Replace Loader is a really, really tiny Webpack loader. And all it does is it gives you the entire text buffer of a file and allows you to run a regex against that file. So rather than editing a whole bunch of files in place, I keep track of a crap load of regexes that I want to do. And it is a lot. Um, this is like less than 5% of the overall regexes that I'm actually doing. I crashed PowerPoint the first time I tried to load a GIF of everything. It was a lot of code. But eventually, it worked. And so now we have this thing called offlinesass.club, which is one of the stupidest websites you'll ever see. Uh, you can load it up. And what it ends up being is this website where we can do on the Oh, sorry, realize that you can't see that. It's this website, which if you go to the website, uh, on the left-hand side is SAS code. On the right-hand side is <coughs> uh, the outputted CSS file. So we can do stuff like change the SAS pink to, let's change it to a different color. And then we can change the font to something, Comic Sans. And we hit compile. And it works. So we can recompile everything inside of SAS in a, in a service worker in the background. We're not online. We're not going to server. It's wonderful. Um, so I felt very proud of myself at this point. I felt like I had conquered, if not the whole universe, a part of it. And <clears throat> excuse me. as a result of that, I sent out a, a tweet to basically say, like, hey, anybody should check this out. And because of the friends that I have, 
uh, I, they sent me how it was horrible. They immediately sent me back code where it broke and how it didn't do half of what they were trying to do. And I was, you know, disappointed but understood because eventually I realized the fourth point of what I was talking about, and that is to test everything. When I had implemented this transpilation of, uh, you know, SAS over to JavaScript, there, I had really only done a subset of the code originally. I hadn't tried to realize the incredible breadth that you could do within SAS. Uh, but a subset of that is to reuse tests whenever possible. Luckily, for those who are unfamiliar with the Ruby community, they have a addiction to testing. They have a ton. Uh, so I actually inherited thousands and thousands and thousands of tests uh, unfortunately, they were written in Ruby, and so I ended up having to transpile those over to JavaScript by hand. Uh, but eventually, I had this file, and it works, and it transpiles SAS. The entirety of it passes their entire test suite. Everything you can do in SAS, you can do in JavaScript in the browser. Not only that, because I had automated it, uh, we get all 80 versions, not just the latest version of SAS, completely automatically generated. It's over eight years of SAS completely done automatically. You can run grunt generate SAS and then go get a coffee, uh, take a break, take a nap, and then eventually you get all these versions. So I was very excited about this. Uh, there's only one small problem. If anybody can see it here, it's right there. Uh, the size of a single SAS file, the minified JavaScript, is 2.7M, which is 2.7 megabytes which is absurd amount of JavaScript to have on your website. And that is technically uncompressed. You know, you can get it down to about 250K, but that is a, still a gigantic amount of JavaScript for any website that literally does nothing. This is just a framework to run SAS code on a website. It's pointless for most websites, which is a problem for transpiled code. Uh, you know, most of these transpiled code is great, but it can be really bloated. And the language designers inside of the browser are very, very aware of this fact. And that's why, for the past number of years, they've been working on a project called WebAssembly. WebAssembly is really kind of the future of what transpilation in the web is going to look like. And in order to understand why WebAssembly is so impactful, we kind of have to go back a few years to talk about an older project called uh, ASM.js, or Assembly.js. ASM was a project that was initially started by this gentleman, uh, Alon Zaki. He is a video game designer. He's now a researcher at Mozilla, uh, with people that make Firefox. And <coughs> in a previous life, he actually worked on a project called Bullet Physics. Uh, Bullet Physics is a physics engine written in C. It's something that is absolutely phenomenal. It's, I could never imagine doing anything this good. Um, this is an example of his engine, Bullet Physics. This is completely computer generated. It's won Oscars. It's been in movies. It's been television. It's, it's phenomenal, right? And, you know, Alan had spent years and years and years making this as absolutely beautiful as possible. And then in 2010, Steve Jobs got on stage and talked about how Flash was never coming to the iPhone. And that scared a lot of people, especially in the game industry like Alan, because he's like, well, crap, I've spent, you know, most of my life doing this, and clearly the future of a lot of computing is going to be mobile. If we can't bring something like this through Flash, we're going to have to bring it through JavaScript. And so, Alan started a new project called Mscript, uh, sorry, Mscripten. Uh, Mscripten is a fascinating project, and in order to understand it, we have to go one layer deeper, I promise this is the bottom layer, to a project called LLVM, uh, which originally stood for Low Level Virtual Machine. Uh, what LLVM is, is effectively a C compiler. Uh, it's able to take C code and then output uh, a native program in order to run. So if you've ever compiled something on Linux or when, you know, any really operating system, you'll usually be using you know, GCC or something else. A lot of modern projects use Clang or LLVM. What made it particularly interesting, though, for LLVM is that it actually had two parts, a back end and a front end. And so just like with Opal, we have one part where we go over our Ruby code, and then we output JavaScript in one major step. LLVM goes in with their front end, in this case a C++ front end, and then it converts it into LLVM bytecode. It's a sort of pseudo language that only makes sense within the LLVM world. And it's something that no one ever actually interacts with unless you're creating code for the compiler, the LLVM compiler, which is what Alon did. He took that LLVM bytecode, that meta representation from all these different languages get converted into, and then he created a new uh, backend for Mscripten. And so what he did was he took all that bytecode, that virtualized conceptual thing inside of LLVM, and rather than outputting a binary file, he actually outputs JavaScript. That means you can take C code, Rust, any language that can be compiled within LLVM, of which there are dozens, and you can output JavaScript. It's 
It's a really, really exciting concept because that means you open up this huge opportunity for all of these different languages to come to the web. Now, that JavaScript right there, that is ASM.js. It's just JavaScript. There's nothing particularly unique about it. It's not like TypeScript where it's you know, a superset of JavaScript. It's actually a subset of JavaScript. They removed a crap load of features from it. And they actually did so in an official spec. You can go to asmjs.org in order to read it. But um, you know, unless you're building an engine compiler or you're really interested in language design, it's boring. Don't do it. <coughs> Uh, what Asm.js actually ends up looking like is this. This is a beautified version of Asm.js, so this is the more readable version. Uh, and it's not really readable by humans because it's not meant to be. It's meant to be JavaScript that can be executed really, really quickly by compilers. It has a whole bunch of different tricks inside of it, mostly a lot of bitwise operators, in order to make your code run as fast as humanly possible, as fast as computationally possible, inside of a JavaScript compiler. And it does so by doing a whole bunch of little tricks. One of my favorites and the easiest to demo on a stage is this bitwise zero. Sorry, bitwise or zero. What this is basically doing is saying, execute whatever it is to the left, but always make sure it's an integer. What it, so the bitwise zero is basically saying, if the thing to the left is not an integer, if it's not a number, make it zero. And so if you returned a string over here, it'd be a zero. If it returns an integer, it gets that integer. The reason why that's important inside of something like asm.js is because consider for a second this code. What is x plus 2 in JavaScript? <coughs> well, it depends. Is x a string? In that case, it's the string plus the number, two, the string 2, so like foo, 2. Is it an object? In which case, it's stringified and then added to the you know, string 2. Is it an integer? Because then we do arithmetic. You know, the compiler has to go through all these checks every single time in order to understand it. It's much more logic. It's much more overhead. Even though we're talking about nanoseconds, it's still more than literally no nanoseconds, right? So instead, if your code was written like this, where it was x equals x, or, uh, x bitwise 0, uh, x plus 2, we know for a fact it is going to be an integer, because x has to be an integer, because it was forced to do so in that first step. That's all that asm is, basically. It's a whole bunch of these little kind of compiler hacks in order to make your code run as fast as possible. Never write your code like this, because your coworkers will hate you. But if you're writing code that's only ever going to be output by a machine and read by a machine, it's great. And as a result of all of this optimization, we're able to take a lot of longstanding legacy large code bases that have been battle tested and bring it to the web. Stuff like SQLJS, which is a full version of SQL inside of the browser. It's not using Web SQL or anything like that. It's, using, it's completely inside of JavaScript, but you can have that inside of the browser. And why you would want to do that, I don't know. I brought SAS to the browser, though. I don't know why anyone would want to do that either. Um, another example, a lot more fun to demo, is quakejs.com, uh, which is literally exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, you can go to quakejs.com, and it is a full version of Quake running inside of JavaScript. And you can do stuff and play. And it uses WebRTC, so you can connect to each other and have a death match locally. And yeah, no, it, it all works. And it's just JavaScript, full version of Quake. It's not emulated or anything like that. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. And then probably my favorite thing that you can do with Asm.js is run Windows 95. Um, so this is actually a full version of Windows 95 running inside of a browser tab. Uh, so you can go to like accessories, paint. And you can draw inside of the browser eventually. <coughs> so uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. sorry, I had this tab open for a while. I promise this actually works. You can go to uh, win95.ajf.me in order to actually try this yourself. Normally, this doesn't crash, but unfortunately, the demo gods hate me. Um, you have, but it is a full version of um, Windows 95. It's actually running a project called DOSBox, D-O-S box. Uh, which is a product that can take uh, you know, any DOS compiler and run, any DOS program and run it inside of DOSBox. It, what they did was they compiled DOSBox and JavaScript over there. So any video game, uh, any command line tool, anything that was running in DOS back in you know, like the early days of Windows, you can actually run on the web today. Archive.org, the Internet Archive, uh, all their game emulation is actually using that same DOSBox, DOSBox pro, uh, project. So, if you were paying attention, you may have noticed that I've only been up till now talking about ASM.js. And you know, I promised that I'd actually be talking about WebAssembly, which is you know, a fair point. And so to understand the difference between ASM.js and WebAssembly, 
um, it's one key difference. Uh, that asm.js uh, in the corner is just JavaScript. There's nothing special about it other than the fast that fact that it's horrible to read and really fast. But because it's just JavaScript, that means the compiler still has to download it, lex it, parse it, compile the code generation, the byte code that ends up being run inside of the browser, uh, which sucks. Most of those times, you know, Windows 95 took minutes in order to download, which you know, is a long time if you're actually trying to use an operating system that's 30 years old. Uh, now, what WebAssembly is, is they basically decided, hey, how about we just skip all that stuff? Rather than uh, sipping down actual uh, string of JavaScript code, what they're doing is shipping down the binary representation, the stuff that's actually output by that code generation process. All of the major browsers have agreed on what that output should look like and are able to now consume and parse and run that. And so you're able to get all of the benefits of this ASM code without any of the detriments. You no longer have to wait those multiple second parsing steps in order to get it to really work. And why this is really cool is that we can look to it for the future of a lot of JavaScript frameworks for high performance and things like that. So for example, we have stuff like React. Uh, React uh, revolutionized the web with this concept of the virtual DOM, where we basically had this cloned copy of the tree where we're able to do multiple operations uh, on it in a DOM-like structure. And then once it's done, we just copy all of those things over to the main DOM. Well, we could write that in, vir in the virtual DOM concept doesn't have to be in JavaScript. You know, it doesn't have to be in the browser. There is already the virtual DOM uh, library where you're able to run that inside of like Node or inside of the browser. And you could easily rewrite that in something like Rust or C or any other programming language and then run it inside of WebAssembly. And automatically, you're able to get it bootstrapped faster than you ever could a JavaScript project because you don't have to lex or parse it. You just get that binary representation. You're getting this automatic skip of a lot of, uh, that a lot of you know, large projects have to hit no matter what. And this is something that's actually already being used in production today by major websites. Uh, this is a project called augv.js for augvorbis. It's a video codec. Uh, and Wikipedia is using this. Uh, Wikipedia, by their own uh, you know, statement, they need to, uh, all video and audio codecs that they use on the website have to be free and open source, which means they want to use augvorbis. They don't want to use things like MP4 or MP3s. Um, and so if you, go to a, uh, if you go to any of the Wikimedia websites and try to play a video or audio file, it will always load augvorbis. If you're in a browser that doesn't support those things, they'll actually parse the entire codec inside of the browser using augv.js and then output it to Canvas in an audio tag, which is amazing, right? You're able to have all these concepts uh, completely in the browser. Not only that, there's also a website called Facebook, which is a large American company. They have this concept where uh, you can upload a lot of files to it, right? So one day I was noticing that they load this one JavaScript file specifically when you start to upload a file. I decided to dig into that JavaScript file, and I noticed that inside of it they have this thing, this line right here that says, uh, module provides LJPEG. Um, I recognized that concept, I started Googling, and I found out that they're actually using LJPEG, which is the C representation of a JPEG compiler, a JPEG uh, codec, effectively. So <coughs> what's happening? is that if you try to upload a really large, large image, like from a really fancy camera, they're resizing it on the client side. Rather than uploading you know, a 100 megabyte image and wasting your bandwidth and your time, they're resizing it in a web worker and then uploading that small version. And they're using it, using it, they're doing it with libjpeg so that they get a bit for bit identical output from the back end and the front end without having to rewrite a JPEG parser on the you know, inside of JavaScript. They're able to leverage all this battle-tested code inside of the browser. So that brings me to my fifth and final point, is to try something stupid. Uh, I learned a lot on this project, and I feel like if you start to play with a lot of C or other projects, bringing them over to your website today, you can learn a lot too. Uh, thanks. It's my email at Microsoft.com. I'll be around. I have stickers. Come find me. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick.